Yes, guys. So let's start our discussion with India's 41. India's 41 is an agree. Sorry, India's 113. Guys, India's 113 is a very typical standard because India's 113 never had any corresponding standard in your IGAP. Like you said, AS10 comparable to India's 16. AS26 comparable to India's 38. AS28 comparable to India's 36. So on, we had a comparable standard at every point of time. But when we come across this concept of India's 113, we do not have a comparable standard under IGAP. So fundamentally, what is the reason? The reasons are very simple. The reason is that this standard, even under IFRS, has only started application from 1st of April 2013. Even under IFRS, this standard started its application from 1st April 2013 only. Prior to that, we never had anything related to fair value measurement, even as per your IFRS. Now, there are multiple places we kept on talking about fair value. Can you tell me where did we use fair value? If you start with India 16, we said whenever there is an asset which is acquired through a government grant, then it should be measured at fair value. An asset which is acquired by exchange of another asset should be measured at its fair value. Where multiple assets are acquired in a single transaction, then they have to be measured at fair value. Guys, however, certain standards did tell you where the fair, how the fair value has to be asserted. But in day 16, when he used the word fair value, he really did not define how the fair value should be asserted. So that is the reason why you need to understand why the standard in days 113 becomes important. In days 113 is important because these standards of India 16 did not explain on how to determine fair value. But if you remember impairment, impairment recoverable value is higher of your value in use or fair value less cost to sell. How to, do, to, how to determine fair value? Determination of fair value we have seen in detail where there is a binding sale agreement, where there is an active market, bid price has to be considered. So many discussions that we had around determination of fair value for the purpose of India 36 which deals with impairment. However, there are a lot of standards which does not discuss about how to determine fair value. If you remember India 2 inventory, he clearly tells you how to determine fair value. But all other standards, India 109 uses a lot of fair value concepts where the determination of fair value has not been explained on how to determine fair value. So India 113 becomes very important to us. But at the same time, remember, India's 113 will never tell you when to determine fair value. Because when to determine fair value is as per the respective standard. India's 16, India's 38, India's 40, lot of other standards, India's 109, where we talk about determination of fair value. If you remember even India's 105, it should be measured at lower of carrying value or fair value less cost to sell. How to determine fair value? Not discussed as per that standard. So therefore, whenever we came across those standards, where it was emphasizing on fair value, but the determination of fair value is not being explained under that particular standard, we will have to root back to India's 113 and see how to determine the fair value. That's why I told you, the standard India's 113 will never talk about when to determine fair value. So then what does India's 113 talk about? When you don't even say where is the standard applicable, he simply says the standard shall apply wherever the word fair value has been used. That's it. Then what is the objective of the standard? This objective of the standard is to particularly determine how to determine fair value. How to determine fair value is what is the objective of the standard. When to determine fair value is not discussed as per the standard. So broadly, if I want to classify or divide the standard into three parts, then I can classify them into three parts. Number one, what is the definition of fair value? Number two, framework for determination of fair value. Number three, disclosures necessary for fair value. Guys, all the three have enough discussion to go around because definition of fair value is important. At the same time, the crux of the standard lies in framework for determination of stand fair value. But then the new addition of your notes to accounts is on disclosures relating to fair value. Guys, with a very, very important and a compulsory concepts of disclosures which have to be analyzed in this case. 
So let's see where do we start the standard. We start the standard by discussing what is the scope of the standard. Where I told you that the term fair value on when to use it or when to use this particular standard in DS113 is not discussed as a part of in DS113. What we discuss as a part of in DS113 is only how to use the word fair value, how to determine fair value. So the scope of the standard is broken down into three parts. One is the definition of fair value. Second one is a framework for determination of fair value. Third one is the disclosures. Clear? So as we progress, we need to first understand breaking down what is the definition. Now you tell me what do you understand by fair value? Let's say for example, I wanted to sell my mobile phone. Okay, my mobile phone has become old. So I wanted to sell it. Me and my friend were walking together somewhere and suddenly I told him, dude, I want to sell my mobile phone. He looked at the mobile phone and he said, hey, dude, this is three years old mobile man. What are you people are still using it? You have looked at my mobile phone. This is last month launched. So I asked him, yeah, even I wanted to buy that mobile only. Yeah? So what do you think the price I could get from this? And he said, probably about 10,000 maximum. So I said, okay, I stopped there and I told him, give me 10,000. I'll give you this mobile phone. He said, no, no, I never had an intention to buy. I am just quoting from what I can believe that that could be the determination of fair value. So your belief of determination of fair value cannot determine the fair value at all. It is your friend's contention that the mobile phone could basically yield 10,000 rupees. That is his determination of fair value. Now let's say I have a lot of memories attached to this mobile phone. I have a lot of memories which are attached to this mobile phone. There's a lot of sensitive data like my passwords which are saved in this mobile phone. So if I lose this mobile phone, then if someone is returning it back to me, I'm ready to give him 20,000 rupees also because that is my assessment of fair value. So fundamentally, when you talk about fair value is such a sensitive concept that it keeps on changing based on who is perceiving that fair value. Who is perceiving that fair value? I'll give you the best example. I was disposing a particular piece of land in February 2019. I disposed that piece of land in February 2019 and they quoted me 25,000 rupees per square year. I sold it immediate requirements of fund and I came out. In the same area, since I was attached to that area, born in that particular area, I wanted to look at an alternate property after six months. And now I asked them, what is the value of this property now? They said it is 35,000. So that means when you go to sell the property, there's a different price which is quoted. There's a different price which is quoted when you wanted to buy the property. Quite going up to land. Look at your currency. Your currency, let's say you're traveling abroad and you wanted to buy dollars from a foreign exchange. So when you went to that, uh, you know, um, Western Union or some other uh, money exchange and you wanted to buy dollars, he has quoted me, let's say 75 rupee 18 paise. I bought thousand dollars with the help of my money quoted at 75 rupees 18 paise and I bought those thousand dollars. My trip was completed. I was still left out with hundred dollars. I went to the same place and I gave it back to him. I said, give me back my 75 rupees 18 paise. He said, I'm sorry, sir. That is our selling price. Our purchase price is not the same. Our purchase price is only 73 rupee 40 paise. So what is happening? The value at which he is selling the uh, currency is not the same value at which he buys the currency. If you remember SFM logic, bid price and ask price always there is a difference, right? So whenever we talk about such kind of logics, we need to come about what is a fair value. Should I take the bid price or should I take the ask price? So that is fundamentally where the discussion goes into what is the fair value and what is the definition of fair value. When I talk about definition of fair value, my fair value can be defined like this. The price at which an asset can be sold or a liability can be transferred. Guys, if you observe, I'm talking about selling the asset. I'm talking about transferring the liability. Did I say a price at which the asset can be purchased or a liability can be acquired? Did I say this language? That means what? I am not looking at purchase price. I'm looking at sale price for determination of fair value. That's why it is called as exit price. 
your transaction price is called as entry price your transaction price is entry price the price at which we want to sell it is called as exit price so fair value is an exit price it is not an entry price or a transaction price so a price at which an asset can be sold or a liability can be transferred between market participants in an orderly transaction on a measurement date so i'll repeat what i said i said fair value is an exit price that is a price at which an asset can be sold an asset can be disposed or a liability can be transferred between market participants in an orderly transaction on a measurement date now let's try to understand what is this market participant who is this uh, who is this market participant what is an orderly transaction and what is a measurement date first let me explain what is a measurement date fair value is always determined for a particular date not for a particular period net profit for the period of financial year 2020-21 is so and so that is net profit for a period fair value for the financial year 2021 is so and so not possible fair value should be determined with respect to a particular date fair value with respect to 31st march 2021 is so and so so there i am emphasizing upon what is the date on which the fair value is determined because their fair value might depend or might differ from one date to the other might differ from one date to the other so that is particularly why i say that fair value is um, related to a measurement date is based on a particular date on which you measure it i don't represent fair value for a period fair value during march is so and so no fair value as on 31st march is so and so so always fair value is determined with respect to the measurement date it is never a measurement period clear so i explain the last part let's come about what do you mean by market participants in orderly transaction guys market participants in simple sense are nothing but buyers and sellers they are nothing but buyers and sellers but these buyers and sellers which i am talking about there are certain essential criteria to be met to call them as market participants what is this essential criteria to be met to be called them as market participants remember i'll call them as market participants only when there is a willingness to transact that means the buyer wants to buy seller wants to sell only in such situation i can call it as a market participant just like i gave the example my friend said that this mobile phone could be sold for 10000 when i asked him pay me 10000 i'll give you the mobile phone he stopped he said no no i have no intention to buy so that means there is no willingness to transact but for a market participants in determination of fair value there should be a willingness to transact number one number two they should be knowledgeable what do you mean by knowledgeable sir high iq level sir gk is amazing sir sir this guy in his fifth class got 99 percentile sir clap for it can i call him as knowledgeable person let's say for example you are selling a technology based software product to me i am a technologically impaired fellow i have no idea about technology but i thought you are advanced technology is what you are selling so i wanted to buy you cannot call me as a knowledgeable buyer because when i call a knowledgeable party then he should know what the asset can do and what the product cannot do they should know what the product can do and what the product cannot do i'll tell you i don't know how many of you came across this but there's something called as tele brands right there are a lot of advertisements which keep playing on the television there's a sona slim belt you know huge advertisement half an hour advertisements they play you put up a sona slim belt i i find those advertisements very fascinating here okay very fascinating So there is a person who ac actually puts up the sauna sim belt, keeps watching the television. Later on, after half an hour, he'll remove it, and automatically he has a six pack abs. Or for a girl, he has she has a complete flat belly. Looking at that, I bought it. I bought it so many times. I bought it. I I put it. I thought I'll also slim down, but it never happened. So that means I am not a knowledgeable buyer. 
had I had the knowledge that you cannot get a flat belly or you cannot lose fat in that particular sauna model, then I can be called as a, a knowledgeable buyer. You go height increase it. You wear this under your shoe, automatically you will increase by 2 to 3 inches. Very good. I applied it 2 to 3 inches. Okay, for me it is not necessary, but if someone else wanted to grow height, they applied it. They were not able to grow height. So that means my intention to buy the product is basically assuming that the product has an ability to increase my height. It has an ability to increase my height. But unfortunately, it did not. When mutual fund advertisements come in, to make sure that the market participants are knowledgeable, he gives a last disclaimer. Mutual funds are subjected to market risk. So please read the offer document carefully before investing. I read it very slowly, but they'll read it very fast. That is to make sure that the buyer or the people who are subscribing to the mutual fund policy is aware that not always that the mutual fund gives you a profit. Clear? So fundamentally, you need to understand that when I say a market participant, these market participants are knowledgeable. There should be a willingness to transact and they are knowledgeable parties. Remember, knowledgeable parties. I drank compliant to become taller, stronger, sharper. Three things he included. Nothing happened. So these are advertising campaigns. I buy boost, I drink boost and start smashing every boundary thinking I am Virat Kohli or Sachin Tendulkar. Is it possible? Just because the advertisement is played by Virat Kohli or Sachin Tendulkar does not mean that you can also bat like them. Now they did not just drink boost and come to the match to score so many runs. There was so much effort which, uh, which happened in, uh, you know, before they got into the ground which is never showed as far as their advertisement is concerned. The advertisement just shows that they drink boost, come and slam centuries out there. So therefore you need to understand a knowledgeable buyer is that one who knows what he is buying. He knows that the product has these limitations. He knows that the product can be used like this. I buy boost because I like the taste of it. I am not expecting myself to become as good as a Virat Kohli or Sachin Elkar in cricket. So that makes me a knowledgeable buyer. That makes me a knowledgeable buyer. Clear? So principal market participants are buyers and sellers. I discuss about buyers and sellers, but come down below. They are knowledgeable. They are knowledgeable because they, I, they can identify the assets and liabilities being transacted. They know for what purpose the asset can be used and what are the restrictions from the use of the asset. There is a willingness to transact. What do you mean by willingness to transact? I am not under any stress to transact. I need immediate funds. So I need immediate funds. So I sold up the asset even at a lower, less than fair value because that is a necessity for me. I was under a stress to transact. I was forced to transact. I was forced to transact. I never had an intention to sell that there was so much of political pressure ar around me that I was forced to sell that particular good. I was forced to sell that piece of land. So that is not a willingness to transact. Willingness to transact appears only when the buyer has an intention to buy. At the same time, the seller also has an intention to sell. Clear? They are independent parties. What do you mean by independent parties? That means buyer and seller are not related to each other. If they are related to each other, then the relation can influence the price. Had it been to an outsider, I might have actually asked you for a higher price. But since you are my friend, I am giving it to you at so and so price. You cannot consider it as a fair value because they are not independent parties. They are related parties who are entering into a transaction. Clear? So a market participant is a buyer or seller who is knowledgeable, who has a willingness to transact and the buyers and sellers are independent. There is nothing which is influencing the price of the transaction. Clear? When I say buyers and sellers, I am looking at principal market or most advantageous market. What is this principal market or most advantageous market? I need to understand. Buyers and sellers for the purpose of determination of your fair value are such market participants who are in a principal market 
or the most advantageous mark. Let me tell. If I can determine fair value is with respect to a principal market, then I don't have to look at most advantageous market. But if I cannot determine what is a principal market, then I'll have to determine fair value in the most advantageous market. What is a principal market? First of all, a principal market is where the largest volume of transactions of similar nature have occurred. Largest volume of similar nature transactions have occurred. I have a share on Infosys. The share of Infosys is traded both on BSC as well as NSC. Out of both, I find that NSC has recorded more volume than BSC. Then in such cases, NSC should be considered or National Stock Exchange should be considered as my principal market and not the Bombay Stock Exchange. Clear? So principal market is a market in which the highest volume of similar transactions have occurred. Highest volume has occurred that should be considered as principal market. What is most advantageous market? A most advantageous market is a market by name itself it is suggesting which maximizes the price which I get by selling the asset or minimizes the price which I have to pay to transfer a liability. Clear? So what is a principal market? A principal market is a market in which the highest volume of similar transactions have occurred. If I can determine fair value with respect to a principal market, then I will not consider most advantageous market. But if principal market cannot be identified, then in such cases, I will have to identify fair value with respect to most advantageous market. Clear? Let's see. If principal market exists, then determine fair value based on principal market. If principal market does not exist or you cannot identify the principal market, then I didn't determine the fair value with respect to most advantageous market. Now let's understand this principal market and most advantageous market with the help of an example. Look at this. A principal market is a market in which highest volume of similar transactions have occurred. Look at the example which I have given you. Let's say there is a dealer in securities and there is a retailer like you and me. If you look at on a current date there are so many IPOs which are going on. If I have to subscribe to a particular IPO my limitation of some invested in an IPO is maximum 2 lakhs. That's it. But to a dealer they can buy how much ever they want. Because retailer has a particular restriction. Retailer can only trade in retail markets, but dealer has two options. He can purchase from interdealer market, sell it in retail market to maximize his profit. Because in general sense, interdealer markets where high volumes are traded, the price is very little or price is slightly lower. But in retail markets, generally the price is much higher. Look at your Ratandeep. How, what is the profit that Ratandeep makes? Ratnips directly buy from the distributors where the high volumes are transacted. Like you and me, they don't buy one single coffee packet. They'll go there to buy hundreds of coffee, coffee packets at one single shot. The price at which he can buy each coffee packet is much lower from the distributor than the price which he offers me when I enter his store. Therefore, that difference is his profit margin. Same way, a dealer has an access to the interdealer market as well as a retail market. In the interdealer market, the volumes transacted are very high, but the value at which the transaction as uh, normally occurs in an interdealer market are slightly lower. But look at re retailer. A retailer in a retail market, the volumes are generally lower, but the value at which the transaction has occurred is slightly higher. In this particular given example, if I think from a dealer's perspective, I am trying to determine the fair value for a dealer, then which market will I choose? If I choose retail market, then the value will be higher. 
but I cannot choose retail market. I'll only have to choose interdealer market because the principal market is a market in which highest volume of similar transactions are traded. Highest transactions of similar uh, similar transactions, highest volume of similar transactions have occurred. Therefore, for a dealer, interdealer market becomes a principal market. And he will determine fair value of the securities held based on the price at which they are quoted in interdealer market. Even though he knows that at retail market he can sell it at a higher price, I will determine fair value only with reference to my principal market, which is the interdealer market. But think from the retailer's perspective the same securities which the dealer held, same securities are even held by even the retailer. But retailer, since he does not have an access to the interdealer market, has only access to retail market, he will consider his retail market as the principal market. And he will value his securities at fair value based on the price quoted in the retail market, which is slightly higher. Therefore, the same units of share in Reliance Industries held by the dealer and the same units of shares held by uh, a, a retailer in Reliance Industries will be valued at a different price. Sir, commodity same, sir. It is share in Reliance. Yes. But remember, who is holding it is very important. And what markets he has an access to. Since it is a share of Reliance does not mean that the fair value is common everywhere. It is not similar to every enterprise. That is why you need to understand that what is the concept of principle are a most advantageous market. Let's say there are multiple markets. Multiple markets are there. I have a commodity. Uh, what commodity? Let's say I have a pen. A pen which can be sold in Hyderabad. A, the same pen can be sold in Bangalore. The same pen can be sold in Delhi. The same pen can be sold in Mumbai. The same pen can be Kolka sent in Kolkata. The same pen can be sold in Chennai. In this case, if I try to determine what is the principal market, I may not be able to determine because the demand for pen is almost similar in every place. I cannot really come up with a logic that the highest volumes are traded at so and so place. It is not possible. Therefore, I will have to consider that the principal market cannot be determined. I cannot identify what is the principal market. Looks like everything is principal market and there are so many principal markets for me. In such situation where I cannot determine the principal market, I will have to determine what is the most advantageous market and the fair value should be determined based on the most advantageous market. That means what? The market price, a market in which the value of the commodity is the highest, the value of the commodity is the highest should be called as the most advantageous market. So what is principal market? It is a marketplace in which highest volume of similar transactions have occurred. Highest volumes of similar transactions have occurred. I have given you an example as well. But if I cannot determine a principal market, then I will determine fair value with respect to a most advantageous market. What is a most advantageous market? A marketplace which maximizes the money which I receive from sale of an asset or minimizes the money which is paid to transfer a liability is called as most advantageous market. It maximizes the return from sale of asset or minimizes the amount required to be paid for transfer of liability. Remember, whenever I determine the most advantageous market and, and the price in the most advantageous market, then I'll have to make sure to determine the most advantageous market, I will have to reduce both the transaction price and transportation cost. Let's say for example, today I'm standing in Hyderabad. I could have sold the product in Hyderabad without incurring any transportation cost at 10 rupees. However, I had to pay the commission agent, let's say 50 paise. Therefore, the fair value in this particular market is 9.5. I could collect 9.5 from sale of asset in Hyderabad. But I say, why in Hyderabad? If I go to Bangalore and sell the same commodity, then it could I could realize 12 rupees there. However, 
two rupees I will incur only in transportation and there is a commission of one rupee out there. Therefore, 12 minus two rupees transportation minus one rupee of commission net amount I will receive after reducing your transportation and transaction cost is only 9. So though I could have sold it at 12 rupees in Bangalore but only 10 rupees in Hyderabad, Hyderabad is the most advantageous market because in determination of a marketplace of which is more advantageous, you need to reduce both the transportation cost as well as the transaction cost. Clear? But that is only for determination of most advantageous market. But when I determine fair value in that market, transaction cost should not be eliminated. You should only eliminate the transportation cost. Here. So why did this concept come in? Because I told you market participants are buyers and sellers who are existing in the most advantageous market or the principal market. Which one first priority? First priority, I will determine fair value with respect to principal markets only. But if principal market cannot be determined or cannot be identified, then I will determine fair value with respect to most advantageous market. What is a principal market? A principal market is a market in which highest volumes of similar transactions have occurred. Then what is the most advantageous market? If I am not able to identify a principal market, I will determine fair value with respect to most advantageous market. Most advantageous market maximizes the return from sale of a set or minimizes the amount required to be paid for transfer of a liability. In determination of most advantageous market, I'll have to make sure that the price of the product has to be reduced by both transaction price and transportation cost. I'll have to adjust the market price in the most advantageous market by both transportation cost and transaction cost in determination of most advantageous market. But when I determine fair value, I should not reduce the transport uh, transaction cost. I am only supposed to adjust for the transportation cost. If I sell it in Hyderabad, I could have sold it at 10 rupees. If I can sell it in Bangalore, then from here to Bangalore, this much transportation cost will be incurred and I can sell the product in Bangalore at a certain price. So the price at which you can sell in Bangalore minus the cost to transport the good should be considered as fair value. Transaction cost should not be eliminated in measurement of fair value. Clear?
So until now, what we have discussed under the standard in days 113 is about <clears throat> what is the market in which I have to determine fair value and who are market participants and what is an orderly transaction. That means only the definition of fair value has been covered so far. But like I told you, the standard is divided into three parts. Definition of fair value, framework for determination of fair value and third one is your disclosures. So the first part is done where I try to define a fair value where I told you that fair value is an exit price, the price at which you can sell an asset or transfer a liability between market participants on a measurement date. So this part is already over. Now let's look into the next concept of what is the fair value and how do I determine a fair value. In determination of fair value, the standard proposes three techniques. Now, someone will come up and ask me, which a technique should I follow? Should I follow any of those techniques or should I follow only one particular technique? I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Let me let's cover first of all, what are these three techniques in determination of fair value? First one, it's called as a cost approach. What do you mean by cost approach? Cost approach of determining fair value is the cost of purchasing the asset on today's date minus the obsolescence of the asset. For example, I have used a vehicle for two years. Applying a cost approach, I can determine the fair value. If I have to buy the asset today, then the asset would have costed me 10 lakhs. But since I already used it for two years, there is certain amount of obsolescence. So two years depreciation is reduced at the rate of 20%. Therefore, basically about two lakhs each year, four lakhs is reduced. And finally, the fair value of that particular vehicle is six lakhs. This is called as cost model. A cost model of determining fair value in, involves replacement cost of the asset reduced by the obsolescence of the value of the asset. That is called as fair value of an asset by applying a cost approach. Similarly, one more approach which I follow is called as income approach. Income approach is a very famous approach as far as your non-marketable securities are concerned. Let's say shares of a private limited company. Shares of Flipkart for 70% of controlling interest was acquired by Walmart at I don't remember the valuation, a whooping valuation. When WhatsApp was acquired by Facebook, everyone was looking at WhatsApp and they said, what nonsense is this valuation? When everyone looked at Instagram being acquired by Facebook at a certain valuation, even we were surprised at how did they determine the value. Was Instagram a listed security? Did you know the fair value of Instagram per share from the uh, market available? Absolutely no. WhatsApp, did it have anything like that? Nothing. The shares were not traded. I cannot identify the value of the share. Therefore, they apply something called as income approach. Income approach is very simple, as good as value in use under India's 36. India's 36, when we discuss about value in use under impairment, what do you do? I'll try to estimate what are the future cash flows generated from the asset and such future cash flows should be discounted to the present value. This approach was called as value in use under India's 36. Same logic I'll apply in determination of fair value under income approach. Income approach is a present value of future cash flows arising from the use of the asset or from settlement of the liability. This is basically called as income approach in determining the fair value. The last approach is called as market approach. Market approach is basically determining fair value with respect to or with reference to the quoted market price in active market. Their quoted market price in active market will be considered in determination of fair value. I have a share of Infosys. How do I determine fair value? Income approach. Eh? Not necessary. Why? The share is already listed on BSE and NSE. You go to your Google search for value of the share of Reliance. Automatically, he'll give you the value per share. That means the value of the share is determined with reference to the fair value already existing in active markets already existing in active market. This is called as market approach. 
let's say i have a share of a uh, technology based company for me the competitor is infosys infosys is listed i am unlisted so what i said was instead of income approach let me take the fair value of infosys only and adjust it for certain changes since infosys is a market traded entity or it is freely traded in the active market let's say there is a restriction for me since i am a private limited entity i will discount the share price of infosys by 20% and say that this is the market price of my company if both infosys and my company are of a similar size or similar nature similar debt equity ratio everything is similar just the fact that they are listed and i am unlisted so since i am unlisted then there is a restriction on transfer of shares immobility is there of my share therefore i applied a discount of 20% on market share of infosys and i tried to determine what is the fair value of my share in such case i can also determine fair value as per your market approach these are the three approaches by which you can determine the fair value of any asset or a liability cost approach replacement cost minus obsolescence number 2 income approach present value of future cash flows arising from use of the asset or settlement of a liability market approach the quoted market price in active market for a similar good adjusted for some changes either way i can determine fair value now question comes up what if for a particular good i can determine fair value under cost approach i can also determine under income approach i can also determine under market approach then which fair value should i consider in such cases the value or the technique which has to be relevant should be based on the fact that they have to observe what sorry they have to maximize the use of market observable inputs and minimize the use of unobservable inputs what do you mean by this market observable inputs are those inputs which i can freely access from the market what can you freely obtain from the market any market price of a share which is listed in bse or nse is an observable input your rate of discounting which is the fair value of time value of money rf factor which is the rate of government bond observable inputs so these are market observable input. i can easily use the market to identify what is the input these are called as observable inputs the money that i will derive from the future use of asset active market cannot determine i will have to estimate i'll have to estimate by using the asset next year i'll get so much year 2 i'll get so much year 3 i'll get so much this is a market estimate but understand i did not pick up any input from the market these are called as unobservable inputs you cannot observe from active market so whenever you are trying to apply a particular technique of determining fair value we'll always have to apply the fair value in by we have to apply the technique which uses the maximum market observable inputs and minimum unobservable inputs clear so which is more relevant depends on the asset depends on the asset where you can say which is more relevant in determination of fair value i am not saying cost model is more relevant the income of approach is more relevant or market approach is more relevant i am saying i am leaving it to you you can choose either of these three approaches in determining fair value but the approach which has to be selected which has to be elected for determination of fair value should maximize the market observable inputs and minimize the unobservable inputs from the market clear but remember there are two circumstances or two such items for which i do not use either of these three approaches there are two particular items for which i do not use cost approach income approach or market approach my determination of fair value is as per some other techniques altogether what are the two items non financial assets and financial liabilities non financial asset what is a non financial asset land building furniture plant and machinery vehicle these are non financial assets stock non financial asset but remember when i talk about financial assets they are debtors cash and bank bills receivable 
all these are financial assets investment in securities financial asset so non financial asset should not be determined based on cost approach income approach or market approach the standard in days 113 prescribes a different approach for determination of fair value of a non financial asset similarly the standard in days 113 also determines value of fair value of a financial liability in a complete different approach where the value of cost approach income approach and market approach are not necessary to be applied so what are these two exemption exceptions and how do i determine fair value for these two exceptions that is regarding a financial liability and a non financial asset let's look at financial liability first whenever i talk about a financial liability determination of a financial fair value of guys definition of financial liabilities we will discuss when we are talking about indias 109 under indias 32 where the definitions will be categorically given so forget about <clears throat> what is the definition but remember anything which can be settled in cash is a financial liability credit a financial liability bills payable financial liability your loans financial liabilities so all these are financial liabilities so with respect to a financial liability i will apply a different technique and i will not apply income approach cost approach or market approach in determination of fair value for a financial liability first see if quoted market price are available for such financial liability if quoted market price is available then your fair value is equal to the quoted price fair value is equal to quoted price but if in case i come across a situation where the quoted market price is not available in such case and i will assume that what uh, then in such case i will take i will assess whether the financial liability which i have is held as a financial asset by another enterprise guys this you will understand under indias 109 or i'll give you a basic example my creditor is my financial liability yes if it is a creditor in my books then i might be sitting as a debtor in someone else's books so that is exactly what we are saying whether it is held as a financial asset by another enterprise if it is held as a financial asset by another enterprise then the fair value of the financial liability is equal to the fair value of the financial asset clear if there is no active market not held as a financial asset by another enterprise then in such cases i will use i will determine fair value based on the maximizing the use of unobservable inputs from the market and minimizing the use of unobservable inputs from the market clear so i'm saying three step hierarchy first categorization or first priority to active market if there is an active market which exists then determine fair value based on quoted market price in the active market if active market is not available then i will see whether the financial liability which i have is held as a financial asset by another enterprise if it is held as a financial asset by another enterprise then the financial fair value of the financial liability is equal to the fair value of the financial asset but if in case i cannot determine even in this manner then i will determine fair value by maximizing the use of observable inputs and minimizing the use of unobservable inputs clear this is the first exception to the techniques of valuation where we have a complete different techniques in determination of fair value of financial liability the second exception is regarding a non financial asset non financial asset determination of fair value should be highest and best use the fair value of a non financial asset like a land or a building or a plant and machinery or a vehicle or furniture should be determined based on highest and best use what is highest and best use if a particular land can be put up for multiple purposes the per the each purpose i'll have to assess what is the cost and the benefit if the cost benefit is highest in one such application then that value should be considered as my fair value i have a piece of land i can use it for parking i can lease out that land i can build a build, i can manufacture i can i can construct a building on that and lease it out so many ways i can use the land under each such use determine what is the highest cost minus benefit the purpose for which the higher the cost benefit is the highest 
should be considered as a fair value. Remember, in determination of highest and best use, I will not consider the restrictions of the entity. The entity cannot lease out the premises. It is the entity's objective. Entity's objectives of the entity has clearly restricted them to lease out a particular premises. I will not consider this restriction. The asset itself cannot be leased. The local authority has already given me a geo saying that this land or this particular surrounding areas, this survey number land cannot be leased. Then that is a restriction of the asset. The restriction of the asset should be considered in determination of fair value, but the restriction of the entity should not be considered in determination of highest and best use. Fair value is not entity specific. It is specific to the asset. That's why restrictions of the entity to use the asset in a particular manner should not be considered in determination of highest and best use. However, if the asset itself has a restriction that it cannot be used in a particular manner, then I cannot, I should not consider that particular use as highest and best use. Therefore, I am coming out with a statement saying that fair value is asset specific and it is not entity specific. In determining highest and best use of multiple purposes for which an asset can be used, I'll have to assess three conditions. First one, is it physically possible for the asset to be used in that particular manner? Number two, is it legally permissible to be used in a particular manner? Third one, is it financially feasible for me to use the asset in that particular manner? Three things I'm talking about. I'm saying, is it physically possible to use in the asset in that particular manner? Is it legally permissible to use the asset in, the, in such manner? Third one, is it financially feasible to use the asset in a particular manner? Considering these three, I will determine multiple uses of the asset. Out of the multiple uses of the asset, the use which gives me the highest and the best use should be considered as a fair value. Let's say the asset cannot determine highest and best use. I cannot determine so many purposes for which the asset can be used. It is not possible. In such case, current use is highest and best use. In such case, current use of the asset should be considered as highest and best use. So what am I saying? You cannot apply cost approach, income approach or market approach, which is your techniques in determination of fair value to a non-financial asset. In the case of non-financial asset, the fair value should be determined based on highest and best use. So if the asset can be used for multiple purposes, I'll have to assess each of such purposes and determine under which use is the asset deriving its best value or the highest value and such value should be considered as fair value. In assessing these multiple purposes for which the asset can be used, I should consider the restrictions on use, using the asset in a particular manner. But the restrictions of the enterprise to use an asset in a particular manner should not be considered. Therefore, I am coming up to say that Restrictions of the entity should not be considered, but the restrictions of the asset to be used in a particular manner should be considered in determining its highest and best use. So I've derived a sentence saying that fair value is specific to an asset and it is not specific to an enterprise. It is asset specific, not entity specific. While determining multiple purposes for which the asset can be used, I'll have to assess three things. Is that use physically possible? Is it legally permissible? Is it physically is or is it physically possible, legally permissible, or financially feasible? If I cannot determine multiple uses of the asset, then in such case the current use can be considered as highest and best use. Clear? These are the two restrictions or two exceptions to techniques of determining fair value. What were the techniques in determining fair value? Cost approach, income approach, market approach. Which approach should I apply? I will apply an approach which maximizes the market observable inputs and minimizes the use of market unobservable inputs. However, there is an exception with respect to financial liabilities and non-financial asset. With respect to financial liability, 
I will see first of all, my first priority is whether there is an active market which exists. If there is an active market for the financial liability, then the quoted market price will be considered as my fair value. If active market does not exist, then see if the financial liability of my enterprise is held as a financial asset by another enterprise. If it is held as a financial asset by another enterprise, then determine fair value of the asset and such fair value of the financial asset should be considered as fair value of financial liability. If you cannot determine market price of the financial liability with respect to active market, neither you can determine fair value with respect to financial asset of another enterprise. In such case, I will determine fair value by maximizing the market use of observable inputs and minimizing the use of unobservable inputs. The second exception was regarding non-financial asset. Where under non-financial asset, I'm saying you cannot have a you uh, you cannot apply income approach or cost approach or your market approach, but instead I will determine fair value based on highest and best use of this. In determining highest and best use, the entity based restrictions for use of the asset should not be considered. But if the asset itself is restricted to be used in a particular manner, such restriction should be considered in assessing the highest and best use. That's why we say the fair valuation for a non-financial asset is asset specific and not entity specific. In determining multiple uses of the asset, we, each enterprise has to assess three things. Whether the use is physically possible, whether it is legally permissible and whether it is financially feasible. If you cannot determine multiple uses of a non-financial asset, then in such case, the current use of the asset, the currently the asset is used for a particular purpose should be considered as highest and best use. Clear?
Yes, guys. Now that we have determined what is a fair value and we have understood the techniques in determination of fair value and two exceptions in determination of fair value, which for which I cannot apply income approach, cost approach or market approach. We have covered this concept. So, so far we came across definition of fair value. It is an exit price, the price at which you can sell the asset or transfer a liability between market participants in, a, on a, in an orderly transaction on a measurement date. That was the definition. And we have seen techniques of measurement of fair value, income approach, cost approach and market approach and two exceptions to it with respect to financial liabilities and non-financial asset. Now, I'll come to the most important part and I will tell you why I call this as a most important part is the disclosure. Why is disclosure so important? Like I told you, fair value by itself, by nature is subjective. If you observe, when I determine fair value as per income approach, it is a present value of discounted cash flows arising from the use of the asset or transfer of a liability. Very good. How do I determine those cash flows? Did he come up and say, did India is 113 here? Explain us, how do I determine those cash flows? At least in days 36, when I determined value in use, value in use very clearly he defined their cash flows from continuing use of the asset minus cash outflows, which are necessary to generate those cash inflows plus terminal cash flows from sale of asset at the end of its useful life. Should not consider financial cash flows, should not consider tax, uh, should not consider tax and should not consider any future unplanned, uh, future planned restructuring cost any increase in cash flows due to future restructuring costs. All these very clearly, categorically he has given. Even regarding the discount rate, there was specific <clears throat> discussion which we had under India's 36. So value in use, where I had such a significant discussion, such an elaborate discussion on, here nowhere when I came up, uh, came up with your income approach, I never told you how to determine those cash flows. So that means, there is a lot of subjective fact. You might determine fair value using those three approaches in a different manner. I might determine the fair value of the similar good in a different manner. That is why I will say even if India's 113 has come in, it is only determining framework for determination of fair value. It is not ascertaining the fair value. It is only saying you have to determine fair value in this way. That's it over. How do I determine the fair value in that particular manner is, de is defined. But exactly this is the way that you have to determine the fair value is not given. So therefore, since it is subjective, I think the user should know. I think it is very valid for the user to know what is the fair value. Correct? You are communicating it the fair value. Let's say I have a share in Infosys held as investment in my enterprise. I took the quoted market price from NSC or BSC and I represented the fair value in my financial statements. Similarly, a piece of land was acquired or was actually given to me as a garment grant. I took the most recent transaction price in that particular area based on which I determined what is the fair value of the land. But there was a restriction given by the garment that you cannot sell the land. So since I cannot sell the land, then I have done some adjustments to it. Saying that the fair value should be reduced by 30% because I cannot transfer the land. Now, so many adjustments you have done and determine what is the fair value of that particular land. I also had investments in our unlisted enterprise where I adopted an income approach to determine what is the fair value. Or I have applied a market approach to look at a similar company which has a quoted market price. I made certain adjustments and I determined the fair value of the unlisted enterprise. Now, if I communicate to the user, the shares in Infosys, the shares in an unlisted enterprise, the value of land, all these three are fair values presented in the financial statements. Is it sufficient? Don't you think the user should know to what extent he can rely on those fair values? He knows that fair value is subjective. But he can say, I can always say that the fair value of investment in Infosys is the most reliable. The fair value of the land is less reliable. And the fair value of the unlisted securities where I have used maximum unobservable inputs is the least reliable fair value. Don't you think this has to be communicated? If I don't communicate this, then the user might have a different intention of fair value 
and you could have a different contention of fair value. That is the reason why the India's disclosures on India's 113 is very important. Where he will try to communicate to the user which fair value is more reliable, which fair value is less reliable and which fair value is least reliable among those fair values which are presented in financial statements. This is given by a fair value hierarchy. What is a fair value hierarchy? Fair value hierarchy is basically determined or basically defined to explain to the user what is the degree of reliance, what is the degree of certainty that he can apply to each fair value which is determined in the financial statements. So I have applied fair value in my financial statements in multiple places which is more reliable, which is less reliable, which is least reliable is given in the form of fair value hierarchy. That is the reason why we come up with level 1, level 2 and level 3 hierarchy. Remember, most reliable fair values are level 1, lesser reliable fair values are level 2 and the least reliable fair values are level 3. They are all fair values. They are all fair values. My intention is to communicate to the user, brother, this fair value is very reliable. You can definitely say this is 100% the correct value. Level 2 reasonably certain that this is the fair value. I am not saying that this is exact but I am saying reasonably certain that this is the fair value. Level 3, don't ask me, I cannot tell you. This is my definition of fair value. Your determination of fair value might be significantly different. Clear? So this is the three levels of hierarchy that we apply. So when I communicate as a part of notes to accounts, I will pick up First, all the fair values which are applied in your presentation of financial statements. All those fair values I'll bring up and I'll say, this is level 1, this is level 2, this is level 3. This one highly reliable, this one less reliability, this one least reliable fair value, I'm communicating it to the user. So this communication to the user is basically determined by level 1, level 2 and level 3 hierarchy. So what is level 1 hierarchy? Directly observable market price directly observable market inputs active market exists i am directly determining the fair value based on market observable factors like i have given you the example of market price of infosys market price of infosys is directly observable input therefore highest reliability therefore classified as level one level two lesser reliable that means i am taking market observable input but I am performing certain adjustments. The land which is right beside me was sold for 30,000 rupees per square yard. This is 500 square yards. So it should be valued at one and a half crore. But this is received as a garment grant for me. Garment put me a, put a restriction saying that I cannot transfer the land to anyone else for the next five years. After five years, I can sell the land. Therefore, since there is a restriction, I am taking the 30,000 rupees as a fair, as a valuation basis, but I am reducing it by immobility or non-marketability discount of 20%. So therefore, a little insignificant changes have been applied and that insignificant change is unobservable input. So direct observable market inputs adjusted by insignificant unobservable inputs should be categorized as level 2 category. Sometimes a market price of an in, of a unlisted enterprise can be determined with respect to the quoted market price. The quoted market price of a particular share of a company is at a certain value. Since I my, my company in which I hold investments is almost similar to the same company, but it is not marketable. So what I do, I'll take the quoted market price and I'll adjust it by immobility discount or a restriction on transfer of share which is a small variation in the quoted market price which is insignificant since it is insignificant unobservable input i will categorize it as level 2 what is level 3 significant use of unobservable inputs don't even ask me there is no mar quoted market price available no similar company is already having a quoted market i am into a specialized segment where quoted market price are not existing. Therefore, I significantly use a lot of unobservable inputs. 
even if I've started with quoted market price, I applied certain adjustments which are not significant, which are not insignificant, they're very significant. Very significant adjustments have been done to direct observable market inputs. And in such cases, since the significant changes have occurred, I have to categorize them as level 3. So what am I saying? The most reliable fair value is level 1. Lesser reliable fair value is level 2. And the least reliable fair value is level 3. Highest use of market observable input, direct use of market observable input is level 1. Taking the market observable input, I did some insignificant changes. I did adjustment, but the adjustment is very insignificant where I use market unobservable input, then it is level 2. Quoted market price not available. Or even if quoted market price was available, the adjustments and determination of fair value was very significant where I applied unobservable inputs. In such cases, you will categorize them as level 3. The same thing is the same thing is giving it to you in the form of certain sheet. Just check. Quoted market price is available. Yes. Then are adjustments necessary? If there is no adjustment necessary, then the fair value is a level one hierarchy. If adjustment is necessary, but however the use of significant use uh, they i have not used significant unobservable inputs then it is level two but if i have significantly used unobservable inputs then it is level three quoted market price is not available but i have significantly used unobservable input is level three quoted market price is not available but my use of unobservable inputs is very insignificant very little then in such cases it is level two this way, I can identify the fair value hierarchy of any, any item which is determined as fair value. Whenever I have a fair value determined, I'll have to classify them under either level 1 or level 2 or level 3. In such a way, I'm communicating it to the user which is more reliable, less reliable and least reliable fair value. It is presented like this. Property, plan and equipment, fair value could be level 3 generally, investments are level 1, receivables are level 1, leases could be level 2. This is my disclosure requirement and how I determine fair value. So three things that we have covered so far as far as India's 113 is concerned. What are the three things that we have covered so far? We have done with the discussion on, we, had, we started with the discussion with what is a fair value? When should I apply this standard? Like I told you, this standard will not tell you when to apply the uh, fair value, but will only tell you how to apply or how to determine fair value. So the standard was divided into three parts. And I told you definition of fair value, your framework for determination of fair value and disclosures. So we have covered all the three parts, but there is one small miscellaneous topic which I have to cover and upon which I can say that this standard is concluded. Clear?
Yes, guys, the old school theory has always been resisting this Fermat. The old school theories have been very resistant to Fermat. Because earlier, if you remember IF, we used to adopt something called as cost approach. Cost approach is more reliable. I agree. Because cost approach will always identify an item at its cost. I spent 100 rupees to acquire this asset. Measure it at 100. That is basically determination by cost approach. But there is also a determination under fair value which is emphasized by index. Where it says, even though I have acquired it at 100, that is a forced sale. That is a forced sale. So that is why he gave it to me at 100. Actually, if I would have bought it under free market situation, it would have been 120. Therefore, in such situation, you can say that transaction price and fair value are significantly different. There is such a restriction from the old school thought that fair value itself by, by concept is one of the most subjective things and why should I incorporate into our books of accounts? Why should fair value be given such greater emphasis? I'll tell you. There is an enterprise which I have done India's on or why I worked with them for transition to India's. They had machinery which was imported 35 years ago. 35 years ago. Initially under Companies Act they started charging depreciation, depreciation, depreciation. By the time I entered the organization and started performing in days transition, I observed that by the time of 2018, when I was doing in days transition, these assets were significantly depreciated. At 35 years ago, first of all, value of a rupee was high. So their acquisition cost in relative terms to today's rate was significantly less. And that too depreciated over 35 years. Imagine what is the value of the machinery. But when we called upon a technical expert to do the valuation of the asset, he said, Sir, the value of the asset, if I determine on today's date, I can say that this asset has another at least 50 years to run. And even on today's date, the asset which I see is the most technologically advanced asset. There is no new advancement which I came come in after this asset was acquired. So I would say that the fair value of this asset is significantly high. But when I presented to my users, to my shareholders, to my board of directors, I am showing the value of the asset at a minimal cost. 35 years depreciated already. And the cost was also 35 years back. Today if I want to acquire the same asset, I had to pay at least 100 times of the price which I paid 35 years back. Cost of material has increased so much. So what the... Uh, uh, my logic is here that fair value though is subjective in nature it gives you a true understanding of what is today's affairs yes i have to apply fair value on a very conservative basis i agree i cannot go aggressive in fair valuation but determination of fair value or presenting fair, uh, fair valuation of items in financial statements is only going to give you a better understanding of financial statements or better representation of fair value uh, of your financial state. Infosys, sorry, uh, your Flipkart, when it was taken over by Walmart, had seven successive years of losses. Seven years of continuous losses. Value, if you look at, at which they have acquired, that was a whooping valuation. My question is, is the balance sheet of Flipkart truly representing what is the value at which Walmart has acquired them? Absolutely no. Because there is a significant restriction of money measurement concept which has been put into your accounting process. Some things which you cannot measure in money terms, you cannot basically present in financial statements. I'll tell you, Flipkart's main asset was its user. Number of people who already had Flipkart installed on their mobile phone are the active users. Now these people who are active users who have been accessing the Flipkart continuously every time we want to buy an item will first check on Amazon then check on Flipkart compare the price and select where you have to buy right that is exactly how we have been doing it or we have been using Flipkart like that but still we are called as active users. Now can Flipkart recognize active users as an asset in its financial statements because that is the main asset. Because Walmart has applied a valuation to Flipkart based on the active users that it has. Unfortunately, 
this cannot be created as a basis unless unfortunately these cannot be incorporated in financial statements because they have the concept of money measurement they have the concept of internally generated intangible asset which should not be recognized as an asset unless they can be measured in money terms so many restrictions are making my financial statements redundant it should not become a simple piece of paper which is not truly representing the value of the company therefore the emphasis on fair value is though delayed is very important on today's day so slowly we are moving into making the financial statements more relevant on today's date. Now the last topic that I have to cover as a part of your India's 113 is regarding the concept of transaction price and fair value. Transaction price is not equal to fair value. Why is that so? Because transaction price is a price at which you enter into a transaction. While if you remember the definition of fair value, we said it is an exit price, a price it, at which you can sell the asset, a price at which you can transfer a liability. So therefore, an entry price may not be equal to the exit price. I gave you the example of foreign exchange. You go to a Western Union money transfer where Forex is being sold or bought, or you go to any other bank to buy foreign exchange, he will give you bid price so and so, ask price so and so. So basically when you want to buy, you pay a higher price. When you want to sell, you pay a lower price. So therefore, the transaction price, a price at which you purchase those foreign currency, is not equal to the price at which I can sell those foreign currency. That's why your entry price may not be equal to your fair value. May not be equal to your fair value or exit price. Whenever I have a transaction to be recognized at fair value, a transaction is in such a way that it should be recognized at its fair value. But I paid a different price while entering into the transaction. Such a difference which comes up should be transferred to PNL unless an alternative treatment is proposed under any other standard. Now, what is this alternative treatment? I'll come to India's 109 where I'll give you an alternative treatment for a similar transaction where your transaction price is not equal to fair value. Here. So I'll tell you why, where it happens. But can you tell me what are the situations where the transaction price is not equal to fair value? Can you quote a few situations? Number one, let's say the transaction did not occur in a principal market. The transaction occurred in other than principal market, but fair value is determined with respect to principal market. The transaction did not occur with the willfulness to transact there was a stress or a force to transact therefore the price at which i entered into the transaction may not be equal to the fair value the volume in which i purchased is not the same volume in which i intend to sell i purchased in bulk but my sale is in piece by piece basis therefore it is again change a transaction between related parties the transaction between related parties, the transaction price is influenced by the relation. But your fair value should not be based on that because fair value is, a, is between market participants who are independent, unrelated. Therefore, in such circumstances, I can come across situations where your transaction price is not equal to fair value. Whenever you have a difference, such difference will be transferred to PNL, either to the debit of PNL or credit of PNL unless another indias is proposing an alternative treatment clear one more last concept which i'll talk about is asset specific valuation exemption if i have a financial asset and a financial liability if i have a financial asset and a financial liability then i will determine the financial fair value of financial asset separately and liability separately you will never determine it on a net basis according to the standard. But now I'm creating an exception. I am saying if the entity wants to settle the transaction on net basis, the entity intends to settle the transaction on net basis and it is legally enforceable. In days one, offsetting of assets and liabilities we have discussed there. If they are in an offsetting position, 
then in such cases i will determine fair value on net basis that means i will determine fair value based on fair financial asset minus financial liability on a net basis this is entity related valuation or entity specific valuation because it is entities uh, entities intention to settle the transaction on net basis but i will still consider it only if the fair value of the net exposure will be considered only if the risk mitigation strategy is documented both financial asset and financial liability should have been measured at fair value if both should have been measured at fair value then in such cases even if the entity is intending to settle uh, to settle these financial assets and liabilities on net basis it is sufficient if you determine the fair value of the net effect instead of try trying to determine what is the fair value of financial assets separately liability separately not necessary only the net exposure if you determine the fair value that is absolutely sufficient and that will bring us to the end of discussion on this standard that is india's 113